Hi, everyone. Welcome to Off the Podium. Uh, I have a guest with me here, uh, Robert Aldrich. Welcome to Off the Podium. Great to be here, if you run. So let's get, let's get uh, started with uh, the big question. Why from English literature to music? <laughs> well, I had always done music as a child and uh, young adult. And my, it was in my family. Uh, and I played guitar. And I played in church. And I played... Uh, you know, bands and I played solo and uh, different kinds of music. So when I went to college, you know, my love of reading sent me to English literature. Mm -hmm. um, but then I took a uh, composition for non-majors class, which is somewhat um, often uh, offered by colleges around the country. It's a, it's a, a composer on the faculty will teach non-majors composition. So, um, and it was like the proverbial light went off over the head when I started writing music. I realized almost immediately that's what I wanted to do. So uh, then I started taking music courses, but I and I I couldn't you know finish a music degree there. So I I took as many music courses as I could graduated from college, took a year off, and then applied to doing the conservatory. And, you know, happily got in with not much experience for the master's degree in college. So I was in Boston for, you know, eight or 10 wonderful years before moving to the New York area. And I know you, you also have in the past played rock music and you're inspired by church music. Uh, why don't you tell us if that is part of your composition now? And how much of that was, you know, um, part of your life early on? Definitely. I think, you know, uh, as I tell my students, and I, it's certainly true in my case, we, you are what you eat as a composer. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, my style uh, is eclectic because I played so many different types of music. So when you hear my music, I hope you hear elements of rock, of jazz, of folk music, of classical music. Of the, you know, I think as American... American composers, you know, we we have an amazing tradition in our own culture, as well as the European culture. But I think for too long, we look to Europe to define the rules for us. And it's only in the last 30 or 40, 30 years or so that we've sort of emerged with our own style, peculiarly American, which which I think is defined by eclecticism, mm -hmm. you know, that that is even from, you know, Gershwin was, you know, my favorite American composer. He had a lot of different influences in his style, but, mm -hmm. it's, he, you know, he helped create what we call American music, which, you know, I'm a happily, uh, I'm, I'm a member of that community because I want to write music that reflects my, everything that I did as a child and as a young adult and as an adult. Well, uh, some inspirational figures in your life who have, you know, kind of inspired you when you were young or even still inspire you now. They don't have to be musicians, but some some, some of the key figures in your life. Well, you know, I'm not a, a big hero person because, you know, I just for whatever reason, I'm not a big sports fan or, you know, I don't have um, a huge number of heroes. But certainly my father was a big influence on me, not only for just life in general. But he played music. He was an amateur guitar and banjo player. And we would sit around, the family would sit around, and I'd sit around with friends and play music at night, after dinner, you know, on weekends. Uh, so, you know, he and my mother, also a classical pianist, and, you know, sang. So they were both influences. I, you know, I was hearing music from very young, and she was a big, she was raised as a classical musician. And... Her father, my grandfather, used to listen to the Met Opera productions every Saturday. In fact, if we went there to visit and the Met Opera production was going, the Texaco Met Opera production was going on, we couldn't, we had to wait until the opera was over before we got to see him. So it was a very, uh, you know, and he himself, my grandfather, wanted to be a conductor, but mm. couldn't afford to. He went to Yale and graduated around 1910, around the same time as Charles Ives. But um, he ended up being a very, very successful businessman, but always loved music. So uh, I think, you know, uh, I owe my family a lot and I owe my teachers a lot also. They were, you know, my first teacher at New England Conservatory, William Thomas McKinley, was sort of 
you know, uh, I came in not knowing very much and he said, okay, you're a composer, start writing. And, you know, he treated me like a composer. And I think that's really important. You can't treat somebody like, you know, they don't know anything or whatever. He just expected me to be composing on a high level already, even though I was very, you know, un, uh, you know, had very little training. Yeah, well, uh, I think a big moment in your career, well, you know the big moments, but uh, when I look at your career, I also saw the Grammy Award, and how much did that do to your career? How, um, how much work did you get post that uh, award, and, and how did that really affect your career? Well, the Grammy was a great surprise. I mean, we I had, you know, many good, fortunate things have happened to me. Um, the Grammy was in 2012, so I was, it was eight years ago. So I was already, you know, uh, in my early 50s, I think, when that happened, and or mid, mid 50s even. So I, um, it was a very uh, fun and ultimately important thing. I, I don't think I would have gone if my daughter, my, who was about 16 at the time, convinced me, oh, dad, we have to go to the Grammys. So we flew out to LA with Herschel Garfine, who was my uh, collaborator, he's the little reddest, and my longtime collaborator and friend. He went with his daughter also. So we ended up having a terrific time uh, in LA and at the Grammys on the red carpet. And it's just, it was an amazing experience. And I, I think the, main, the, the surprising thing was I didn't expect it, you know, to be, I was sort of a little bit cynical about, oh, okay, this is, you know, a pop music event and whatever. And it ended up being a wonderful, uh, the afternoon ceremony where they give it, you know, in the evening, it's really all about the pop, a few categories in the pop and rock music and rap. Um, in the afternoon, it's the real place where the most of the music community uh, and by music community, uh, the Grammys are voted on by our fellow members. So National Academy of Arts and Sciences is the organization that um, sponsors the Grammys. And it's composers, musicians, producers, you know, of all stripes. And they give out several categories of awards, including the classical music. And the Grammy that we won was for Best Contemporary a composition so it was a it was a really great event and I, I suppose it's um it was important too because it's probably going to be in my obituary you know grammy winning composer yeah uh, and whatever i'm introduced you know anywhere usually it says grammy winning composer and so <laughs> so it's held you know it's held in high esteem by people and by musicians yeah. uh, so i'm i was honored that i uh, the first time I was nominated, uh, won. Yeah. Well, uh, let's talk. Uh, we could talk a little bit about the piece that won, but also I want to hear about the process because each composer has a different process of how to even approach a composition, whether it's a five minute piece or a two hour piece. Uh, what's your process? How do you approach a piece? And maybe even a little bit about the approach for your Grammy award winning piece. So, in general, I think approaches differ for each composer. Uh, and, and they even differ within the piece, because if you're asked to write a very short piece or you commission, it's a little bit different. Uh, you know, both my operas were two and a half hour long, you know, just the music part of it. So it's a, that's a, you know, because you have to, it takes a fair amount of time to put mm -hmm. that together. A short piece you might write in a very short amount of time. So the process is different. In general, I don't like to start at the beginning because I, uh, I always think that slows down a, an artist or a composer. So I like to, you know, I tell my students and I tell myself, so start in the middle of the piece, start with the climax. Where are you going? Find the emotional core. Uh, if I'm setting a poem or text for a libretto, I try to find where is the emotional core, the emotional climax, and get that going first so I know where I'm going. And I find that's better. If you start from the beginning, you're, you don't know quite what you have, and it, it often leads to people getting stuck because they, they come up with a great opening, and yet, uh, you know, what comes next? And then they, they sort of get scared, and that's what slows people down, I think. If you're writing at, you know, all ends, my wife is a painter, uh, a landscape painter, 
And she, in her studio, she has about five different paintings going at a time or little drawings or things. And I think a lot of visual artists work that way. So that's been influential to me as well, because, you know, uh, they'll go to this canvas and then this canvas and this canvas, and then maybe they'll work on this for more. But I think the whole theory of that is you don't want to get bogged down in one. And also you want to let another canvas inform the other canvases that you're doing. So I I like that idea and 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 using it in music. I don't generally work on lots of pieces at once, but I work on lots of parts of pieces, the same piece at once. So I'll have something, you know, like the climax. I'll have something I think is going to be an ending, a beginning, a development, and then gradually it just kind of comes together. Yeah. Well, since you're already speaking about all of the, these ideas, is there a piece, is there a genre, is there an instrumentation that you've always had in mind, you really wanted to compose and never had the opportunity to compose? Well, uh, you know, my operas, I, I really always wanted to write an opera, and I've been able to write two of them, both with the librettist Herschel Garfine, who's a wonderful writer and composer. Mm. And uh, so opera was, you know, a, a big goal of mine, and I think for many composers it's the ultimate because it combines you know uh, music vocal music instrumental music sets costumes lighting you know everything so traditionally opera has been seen as a you know as a high watermark in civilization and you know so i think most composers want to try their hand at opera and i've been fortunate to write two that have been performed and recorded so uh, I'm lucky, I think, that way. Very lucky. And not small operas, large operas with large cast and large uh, orchestras. The Milwaukee Symphony, uh, you know, a terrific, one of the best orchestras. And so it's a thrill when that curtain opens, opening night, and you realize you're going to be hearing uh, two and a half or three hours of only your music. So yeah. that's a thrill that... Uh, not that many people get to experience, but it's it really is up there in terms of special experiences in one's life. You know, uh, even doing this podcast, sometimes going back and just kind of putting it together and just making, and I don't even spend too much time on actually just producing it. I, I have the conversation with you. I listen to it once. I cut a few parts uh, and then I just post it. But um, I would imagine you spend so much time with your own compositions and then how do you just go back listening to it again and again? Do you, do you ever have a time where you're like, I really don't even want to listen to my own piece? Oh, yeah, definitely. And there are times, I mean, I don't actively go back and listen. And sometimes a, an older piece of mine comes on and I realize I haven't heard it in years. You mm -hmm. know, a student will be looking through my, you know, where somebody will, and they'll play an old piece of mine. And, you know, I'll think, wow, uh, you know, and it seems because, pieces that you wrote 30 years ago or more, it's hard to imagine even writing them, you know, yeah. you forget the process, you know, when, when you're involved in a composition, it takes sort of every ounce of your being to focus on that. That's why composition to me is such an addictive process, because when you're writing music, every sense in you is being engaged oh. to, you know, to make this thing work. Uh, so, you know, but when you move away from your own works, you tend to, you know, move away from them and forget, you know, once you get it, I'm in my 60s. So, you know, I, I for, I've forgotten mostly the stuff I did when I was younger, or largely forgotten. So, you know, it's, uh, but it's fun to sometimes go back and listen to things you haven't heard in a long time. Yeah. And you realize things that you could do better now, or but things that surprise you, because you probably couldn't think things up i think you get for young people their imagination is very powerful and that's a great thing and for my students i always try to bring that out like the power of their imagination because they have lots of ideas as you get older you have less ideas but more craft so <laughs> so i always marvel at my young students they have like they come in you know with a ton of ideas and some of them are really great and then what you, my job is to kind of help them whittle it down. So yeah. they've got too many ideas. We've all heard pieces where there are too many ideas going on. And as wonderful as they can be, that's just, that's not really, you know, 
uh, I mean, there was that, there's that Western civilization, uh, you know, uh, sort of idea of unity and variety. And that really is for me, uh, you know, a really, you know, I want to plant my flag in the unity variety department. You, you need to have unity because otherwise things see, seem abstruse and chaotic. You want to have variety so that the listener doesn't get bored. Mm-hmm. And so I really try to teach um, and, and live myself the idea of unity plus variety. Mm-hmm. Revising, it's another interesting topic for me. Do you revise and do you revise, you know, say five years later, you think about that piece again, do you go back and say, I'm going to make some changes or you just leave it alone? Uh, I rarely go back five years later. And in fact, I I encourage students, if they are going to make revisions, do it right after the piece is premiered because you still remember the piece. The piece is firmly lodged in your brain and in your heart. And, you know, the changes you need to make, do it then. Uh, and there are composers, by the way, who you may have talked to who never revised. It's just they, they think their aesthetic is composing is like keeping a diary. And what would you go back and change your diary and say, I didn't feel that way that day? No, I mean, you know, so they, so, and they, that, that's a valid point. I'm not like that. I, I need to revise while I'm working on a piece incessantly. Wow. But then I tend to, you know, unless there's really something that, you know, didn't work, but you think the piece, I think when I was younger, yeah, there were times when I was happy with seven eighths of the piece, but one eighth really went off the rails somewhere. So I would go back and try to fix it. Sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. That's the yeah. thing. But five years later, it, it's, you know, you're a different person in a yeah. way. And so coming back and trying to change something, at least other than small details, uh, is difficult. Hmm. How about commissions? Uh, you know, what, what's your approach? Do you, uh, do you like when you have rules and regulations when you're composing? Or do you just, do you wish that someone would just say, compose whatever you want? How, how do you approach those situations? I, I, what do you like, prefer? I, I like limitations, and I think most composers do. Stravinsky said... Uh, you know, when limits, uh, when I'm limited, my mind is set free. You know, there's a certain, and you know, it, it seems, you know, like that's a contradiction. But, you know, if someone says here, the, the piece has to be this long, it's for this, and we want it about this, there's something, you know, those limits tend to liberate you in a certain way because then, you know, you don't have to worry about how long it is, what it's for. You know, all of that's been established for you. So yes, I, you know, um, orchestras tend to want, you know, to commission you to do a piece that's either going to be the first piece, it's going to be a concerto, you know, uh, or whatever, very rarely a second half piece where the blockbuster pieces usually are, the big, you know, the Mahler Symphony, the Beethoven Symphony, the Brahms, you know. um, So... Uh, whereas people who have commissioned me, you know, there are people who just are patrons, you know, and they commission you to do something that uh, is often for a relative, for an occasion, for, uh, you know, one of what probably the biggest commission I've done that Herschel and I did was the, my oratorio Parables, which is was written in about 2010, so 10 years ago. And I got a phone call from a conductor who conducted my work years ago around the turn of the millennium, 2000. And uh, he said, look, we have a patron here who wants to have a composer write a piece for his mom's 90th birthday. And it's just got to have a hymn in it. That's the only thing. It's for orchestra and it's got to have a hymn in it. So I think he was thinking like Mahlerian Symphony with some kind of, you know, uh, American hymn. And I said, look, um, can I get back to you? And I called Herschel and I asked, look, can we, uh, are you interested in writing an oratorio? And he said, yes, you know. And uh, so I called back the conductor and I said, look, can you go back to the patron and say we want to write a a piece for orchestra, chorus, and four soloists? Um, 
you know, a much bigger piece than we had planned. And I said, and we'll take religion as the main theme of it. So I thought, okay, we're never going to hear from this person again. Uh, and then he called back like a day later and said, it's to go. And I said, then we worked out the money and, you know, all the details. And it was, uh, the performance was already set for like a year later. So this was a 50 minute piece. So basically all I did that year was work on that, on parables. But we had to come up with the whole story ourselves. And Herschel did a brilliant job with the libretto. It was basically comparing, using the music of Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, and talking about the shared uh, stories, the shared parables that all of those religions have. They're all monotheistic religions, and many of them have the same, uh, different versions of the same story. Mm -hmm. And so that was a, you know, that was something where the limitations were kind of open, and we needed to put, you know, a, we needed to build the frame ourselves. It was very challenging, but very rewarding too. Well, uh, with all that said, I, I'm trying to, and I ask this of many of my guests, what can we do to get more people interested in what we do? Because I just, I, I just wish it was more people had access to it or more people just were interested in it because there are so many people who have access to it and are just not interested. Is there anything that we're doing wrong or as, as musicians or what should we be doing better? I mean, just some, some of your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, it's a, you know, that's the big question for classical concert music is how do you engage more people? Because it's such a, when you look at the statistics, it's such a small audience um, relative to how many actual people there are. Um, you know, education, I mean, when I was growing up, there was a music class in almost every grade that I had. And then, you know, being in the high school choir, or the high school orchestra was a really coveted thing. And the high school, my high school choir in Princeton, New Jersey, you know, they toured and it was, a, you know, concerts were packed. And so parents and families were very much involved in, in music. And then, uh, but I think that world has largely been lost. I mean, there are still bands and choruses and whatever, but it tends to be the, the, number, the amount of music classes K to 12 is not that much. You know, it, given my daughter's 25, so when she went through school, I saw progressively that there was less and less music going on. And therefore, at certain levels, there were lots of kids interested, and then you gradually see it drop off through high school. And then um, I don't think much, most people uh, resonate with classical music of the way, you know, we feel that they should. I mean, I always, thought okay as i got older classical music and concert music of course you know being a composer it would it would be more important to me but um i stopped listening to as much other stuff and stopped listening to more concert music and recorded music and classical music just because i feel like um as you grow older this is the music that can speak more to you as a as an adult uh, you know, it certainly spoke to me as a kid, too, but in a different way. And it, I, you know, I just don't need pop music. I, I did it a lot as a kid, so I feel like that's in me, whereas the classical music I needed to sustain myself. So somehow we've got to get in the education system music more prioritized. And mm -hmm. then I think the mistake that symphony orchestras have made, uh, if I may be bold to say so, is this rigid sort of formula which is start with an overture go to a concerto with you know either long long on the top end or you know whoever you can afford that's just graduated from juilliard on the bottom end and then the second half you've got the you know the blockbuster symphony uh that's you know by a well-known previous composer no what you know and that just happens time and time and time again and i think it seems it's a little remote to people, you know, and when I've talked to people about hearing classical music that haven't had much experience, they, they, they always say, I mean, generally they say different things, but some of the things that crop up again and again, and it, it seems so formal. Those people are in tuxes sitting on the stage, not moving, you know, and there's one person waving his arms and then everybody else is, you know, 
And so it seems remote, like, you know, when, when people hop around on stage at a rock concert, we know what that means, you know. Um, so, and there's some truth to that, right? That, you know, that, that there's, um, that there is, uh, there's some kind of connection that we're not making that needs to be made, you know, and opera even, I've noticed in going to opera that a lot of younger people go, it, it seems to have, in some uh, towns like National Opera, which premiered Elmer Gantry, this was 13 years ago. It was kind of date night. Uh, people, college students at Vanderbilt, various colleges, they would, they would bring their girlfriend or a date to the opera because, you know, that was a big deal. And whatever your musical training in opera, the story is the big thing. You know, you, you don't have to have to be that sophisticated in music to make the story uh, the big thing and to follow the story. You don't need that much sophistication. So I think that's what's really, you know, when people go to see Wozzeck that's never been to an opera, they're, they're drawn in by the story, the music, you know, it, and they're drawn in by the intensity of the music. If they can't identify with it, because it's unlike what they've heard, they identify with the extraordinary intensity and the drama. So I think opera has a little bit of an advantage that way with the story. But mm -hmm. symphonies, I think, have to find a way to make it, uh, make the story, make a you know, that a story is being told here mm -hmm. and a very important story. And I know orchestras experiment all the time and, you know, we'll see. But, um, and particularly oh. now when there's no music, you know, going on, yeah. what's going to happen when, you know, I mean, now the, it's a whole other thing because, you know, what's going to happen to the concert experience mm -hmm. after this pandemic? Yeah. And, I mean, huge question. An existential question, and yeah. none of, I don't think anybody knows the answer to that. Yeah, and I was going to ask you about that, how you were dealing with it, and what your thoughts for the future. And as you said, it's it's really just a mystery for now because it's. I, I think a lot of people are thinking about the possibilities, but it's just so tough to think about uh, classical music or jazz uh, without an audience or just remotely or something it's just such a big thing to think about i think we've never thought about this or uh, people have thought about it but not so seriously and so uh it, it's so present yeah, in our lives it's, it's now in our faces and yes. so i mean my whole you know from the time i was 22 and decided to be a composer when you're a composer of concert music to, to me, the most important thing is the live music experience. Mm -hmm. That's what you want. I mean, I've had several recordings, and that's a fun thing, too. Uh, you know, some composers I know, they only are interested in recording to have a record of their works for the future. You know, that's okay for me. I, I enjoy the live music experience most, sitting in an audience, you know, looking at players on stage playing my music, you know, or, or my colleagues' music or other people that I don't know. Mm -hmm. To me, that's that drives me, you know, that feeds me. Um, how, you know, what's gonna happen if, if concerts have to be done in a different way, delivered in a different way, it's never, you know, I mean, it's never dawned on me that the live music experience would be compromised, yeah. but here we are. Well, changing gears a little bit, I wanna know if we were to um, open your computer or whatever you use to listen to music, what would the latest couple of tracks be on there? What composers, what pieces? Um, well, you know, when I'm writing, I don't try, I don't listen a lot because um, it. I tend to be influenced by what I'm hearing. You know, huh. if I hear Ravel, my love, you know, uh, I'll, I'll start like, you know, that'll creep in um, to what I'm writing. Not that that's a bad thing, but, you know, I just, I tend to listen less. And then when I'm not writing, I tend to put, you know, listen to a lot of things. Um, I, uh, my seminar, my composition seminar at Rutgers uh, does different projects each semester. We'll do opera and musical theater one semester. We'll do collaborations with dance another semester. This, we did music for, in the fall, we did music for chamber music and strings. So I tend to listen to a lot of repertoire that we're, you know, what we're doing. So this semester we're doing works for solo piano. And so I've, I've listened to a lot of solo piano stuff recently, like uh, all the way, you know, from Bach to Ligeti, 
you know, and you know, what a tremendous, um, I'm not a pianist, so uh, I didn't know the repertoire. You know, I hardly listened to Chopin etudes, which are amazing. I, you know, I, uh, you know, Ravel piano music, the Ligeti etudes are astonishing. Uh, you know, there's, uh, so I tend to listen a lot because, you know, I need to do it for the, I need to recommend literature for the class to listen to, to get them experiencing this different kind of music. So, and, you know, last year it was, there was a section on band and then there'll be one on orchestra. And so I'll tend to listen to a lot of that, but, you know, um, I have my favorite composers, but a lot of times I don't even need to listen to them. I just can imagine my favorite pieces, like you take Mahler, you know, you can just say the word Mahler and I start hearing this, you know, hearing like the, you know, uh, the, the, the Mahler symphonies I love, you know, yeah. as a conductor, you, you know, I mean, everybody lives, the conductor at, at Rutgers just finished a Mahler cycle where all nine symphonies were done, wow. which was amazing. So, uh, you know, uh, uh, we have such a rich musical tradition, the Western musical canon, in, in all of these things from opera to orchestra to chamber music to solo to, you know, art song. Yeah. So. Well, uh, this is this uh, question always is interesting to me. This next one is because I want to hear from a composer's perspective. If you were to recommend a composer, a name that most even classical music music fans would not know, what would that one composer be, or maybe two composers that most people don't know, but you are contemporaries? Any composer. It could be from 200 years ago that most people don't even listen to now. It, just any any composer that comes to mind, like, I wish I heard more of that composer. Well, there are people, uh, there are colleagues of mine and, and of, the, of music that I really like and think mm -hmm. that it's underappreciated. There's a, a colleague of mine that um, she's an adjunct at Rutgers uh, and, you know, young composer, me, or, you know, in her 40s, Amanda Harbour, who's re writing some really wonderful music, particularly mm -hmm. for winds and uh, chamber music, but, you know, other things as well, orchestral music. She was one of the first women at Juilliard, woman composers 30 years ago. Uh, you know, she was like the only woman in her class, uh, you know, in the, in the 90s, early 90s. So um, that shows you how far we move. You know, I mean, women composers, there were so few, you know, and now in, in the, at Rutgers, we have, you know, not half, not, not, it's not half women and half men, but it's 40%. So it's really, I'm really proud of that as, uh, you know, that, that there's a lot more attention being given to women composers, mm -hmm. people who, you know, have been overlooked. Wow. That, I mean, there are a lot of, of stuff that's been overlooked. Um, I, uh, you know, uh, that's a deep question. Myself. Yeah, so, uh, but no, that, that's great. I, I'm, I'm happy you gave that name. I'll definitely listen to it and hopefully some of the listeners as well. You know, she's got a great website and, uh, you know, she's got some wonderful music and, and being championed now by lots of people, uh, you know, as she should. And it's exciting to see a younger composer coming along and finding their voice and, and you know, being discovered. So, what what's a life changing moment for you? It can be musical or non musical. Oh, you know, there were a few. I guess one was you know, to decide to be a composer, but that wasn't. It almost was like I had no choice, mm -hmm. and I was young enough. You know, when you're 21, and and I told you when that light went off over my head that I wanted to be a composer. It's sort of like I had to be. So it wasn't a hard decision. Uh, life-wise i think later i thought about it wow it must have been crazy to do that like in my parents were sort of like what you know and i see that same process going on with my students you know their parents are going okay that he's great he's very talented what's he going to do being a composer you know and, and uh, so i can feel their uh you know the tension because it's not you know if you're a violinist but okay you go out and you get gigs and you you know you play in orchestras and you do this, it's very visual, you know, it's very 
tangible, tangible what they do. But for a composer, you know, we live in our heads, right? And we write things that are in our heads and then on paper and then they're played. So that's a whole mysterious process that's, you know, complicated, but beautiful. Um, I think the biggest decision for me was going back for my doctorate. It's, you know, I, I, it wasn't, it's not a, it doesn't sound to people like a, you know, profound thing, but uh, there was a certain point in time when you needed a doctorate, which is now, and, you know, well, to be a professor in a college at a university or conservatory. So you definitely need a PhD or BMA. And I was 40 and I didn't have a BMA and let them, you know, started having a family and all of a sudden, okay, I've got to grow up and get a real job. So I had to go back to school. And so that was a tough decision, I'm, you know, cause I was already being commissioned uh, quite a bit as a composer and working actively in the New York area, you know, and winning awards, things like that. So I had to say, okay, I'm going to put this on hold, go back and get a doctorate. So I guess that was the, but it paid off because you know, if you don't have your doctorate, you just simply won't be considered for positions. But now it's an important part of my life. I, you know, I'm, I'm a composer, but I'm also an educator. And, you know, many of us do that. Uh, but that's the road that really led me to being able to be an educator on a, you know, at a university in, with a big program. And uh, so the t that was a tougher decision, but one that I'm glad that I made. Well, uh, your fans and followers, uh, something that they might not know about you that you're willing to share with us. <laughs> um, well, I love to cook. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, it, it gives me, I guess it's great therapy. Uh, it's something very different than composing, uh, but it shares some of the, you know, uh, maybe it shares some aspects, but for me, I, you know, I don't follow a recipe at all with my composing and, you know, composing in essence is making decisions. You know, you say, yes, I'm going to do this. No, yes, no. It's about, is this going to be forte? Is it going to be piano? You know, every, uh, every element, every note, every aspect of music is making a decision that you're going to do this. You're not going to do that. So with cooking, following recipe gives, is, is very different. And so, you know, I have my favorite cookbooks and I love Italian cooking. So uh, when I was on sabbatical a few years ago, I, I've cooked at least five times a week, uh, you know, but, you know, and it, it was uh, terrific. So maybe that's something they should know. But don't come over for dinner now, but, uh, you know, sometime in the future. <laughs> um, you know, as you mentioned, it's really tough in this feel to get a job and uh, to to make a career uh, what advice would you give to young young musicians young composers stay with it i mean you know there's so many discouraging elements um and you know i i would i started so late i mean you would never be able to make it starting in college as a violinist you just couldn't you couldn't develop the technique or whatever but as a composer in music history there have been a fair number of people who got like law degrees or medical degrees and then became great composers. It's one of those things you can start a little later. So I was so determined to, to succeed and catch up that I, I, you know, I wasn't so worried about now I look at the difficulty of the field and I, you know, it's very tough, but one of the things, I mean, I've had success. I've had periods of failure, I've had periods where it took, I mean, it took 18 years for my first opera to get done from the time I started it. And I thought many times it was going to be a failure. Then to have it, you know, uh, performed to great acclaim and then winning a Grammy, you know, I, I just wanted to say, you know, there were so many times that I basically was felt that it was over, that, I, you know, the opera was had no future, it was going to stay in my study and no one was going to do it. And then it happened. And then when it happened, it really happened. So, you know, stay with it and you got to deal with failure and rejection. And, you know, it's, it's part of the business. I really feel for performers. My daughter is a, me a mezzo and a fabulous singer. And she goes to auditions and is rejected all the time. You know, she gets into the finals of something 
some big prestigious thing, you know, and then doesn't get it. And like, or, you know, something she gets and, and, you know, if she was got to the um, semis of the Met council competition, the annual competition, but I see, you know, she's young and the young musicians, they, they have to deal with rejection and it's very tough. I, you yes. know, I don't know if I would have encouraged her to, you know, to, but, but that's her gift. So she has a terrific gift, but you have to be, you have to develop the psyche to accept, you know, that, uh, failure or rejection, you know, that they're, you know, at the end, they're not that many good jobs or competitions or whatever. And if a lot of people are trying for them and conservatories are putting out, you know, better, better musicians than ever now, you know, but the, the jobs aren't necessarily growing or the, you know, the positions for people or the roles for people in the opera companies. So you really have, you know, just stay with it. And for composers, I'd say, you know, you, you don't don't think about early success. That happens to some people, you know, that are sort of blind luck, get that early success, but most don't. So you have to wait, but the waiting can be great too, because then when it happens, you realize it's not just you were, you know, picked somehow randomly, yeah. you really, you know, when I started to get successful, whatever, whatever successful means, I realized, you know, I was old enough to really appreciate it and really know that I deserved it. And not just that, you know, I was, it was randomly given uh, for by a critic or by uh, an opera company who picked you or a conductor. So I think, you know, the main thing, just stay with it. Yeah, that's tough. It's tough. And I was going to ask you about success. What does what does it mean to be a successful composer, a successful musician? If you don't win those big awards, are you still successful? It's so tough to deal with these things, you know? Right. No, I mean, the, the only the, 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 the thing for composers that's different than anyone else is you can still, you know, if no one recognizes you, you can still sit in your room and compose. You know, Emily Dickinson got, you know, they found her stuff in a trunk her poems uh, composers the same way we can you know uh, they're you know uh, you could you know I've often thought okay this is going to be you know no one's commissioned this piece but this is going to be a nice surprise for somebody after I'm gone you know and so we have the you know as a performer it's tough or conductor you, you know, you're, you're relying on the outside world to say, yes, you can do this. Yes, yeah. you've won that. Yes, we've given you this job or this guest conducting thing. Yeah. You, you know, it, it, same with actors. They always have to be looking to external forces to, you know. But yeah. with composers, we can just sit in our room and compose. Yeah. And that's what I, you know, for you asked about what advice. You do that sit in your room and compose hmm. and, you know, put yourself out there in some ways and then wait for the world to discover you. They may not. Then you have to take the rewards you get from composing. And, you know, I think most composers would tell you that the internal joy that you get from composing well, there's nothing like it. Like, yeah. really nothing like it. Like, you know, uh, it's in your head. It's on the page someone plays it you know yeah. that process is to me the most the greatest thing and you know why I'm a composer and what I enjoy about that process and even having done it many many times and on many different genres and levels it's still uh, mysterious and fascinating mm -hmm. and always you know just uh, stimulating yeah. and well, last question for me. Uh, do you have a piece that's sitting around that's no one ever played before? Uh, sure, yeah. And, and once in a while, um, I'll look back at a piece. You know, I think most composers have something that they start and then don't finish. Or, uh, you know, I mean, when you get to my, uh, where I am in my career, not that it's that, you know, that I'm that well-known or anything. It's just you generally work by commission, meaning someone contacts you and says, you know, 
hey, we're going to compose, you know, we're going to commission you to write X. Hmm. And, you know, one of the unfortunate things, you're supposed to have, I was supposed to have a meeting in March, mid-March with a well-known regional orchestra to commission a piece for me. And, you know, there was, it was, that was going to happen. And now, you know, so generally we work, it, you know, at my stage by commission, you get commissioned to do things and do it, but we always have labors of love, you know, and uh, all of us, I think most of us work on something that's not commissioned, but because, oh, I really want to write this piece, you know, and so I do have, you know, things lying around and every once in a while I take a look at them and realize that, you know, hey, this could be something. Yeah. And then other times I take them out and say, mm, I don't know, you know, or the occasion. But yeah, I think most composers have a secret piece that they're, that is not a commission that no one sees mm -hmm. uh, until maybe someone asks for it or you get, you know, I myself have the desire to get it out there. Mm -hmm. I'm very lucky because I have a publisher, CF Peters, and they publish pretty much what I do. So I'm very, very fortunate in that. Um, you know, that I have a big publisher that I have an exclusive contract with. So I can actually, you know, give them pieces that weren't commissioned and they'll publish them. So, oh. but that's, I'm very lucky. And most people, younger generation is more self-published now. And that's a good thing too, you know, because they, you don't have to share 50% or 80% of the profits with your publisher. Yeah. But I, I love having a publisher, so that's fine. Yeah. Well, I did say last question, but uh, I thought about this. And uh, your wife is an artist. Your daughter is a singer. Has there ever been a collaboration? Uh, with sure. all three of you? I, uh, I write, I mean, not with my wife, per se, although I'm inspired by her painting, but with my daughter, all my, you know, both of my operas have been written with her in mind. She's a mezzo, and she has been since she's young. And so all the all of the lead roles in my operas, or ones that will be, will be mezzo roles because okay. I'm hoping that she um, she sings them one day. Okay. You know, she sung, she certainly sung parts of them. And she was a few years ago when she was in high school. She was on this show from the top, which features oh, yeah. you know, the radio show with Chris O'Reilly, and she sang some of my she sang some of Elmer Gantry on the show. So that was thrilling. It was in uh, Santa Fe, and we went out to Santa Fe, and have, you know she sang Elmer Gantry with Chris playing, and that was. And I went to doing the conservatory with Chris O'Reilly, oh. so that was a great kind of confluence of things. Mm. And to have your daughter sing your music is, you know, that's anyway, amazing. So, yes, so I and I hope to collaborate with her in the future. Maybe she will even commission you one day. <laughs> Yes, I think she, uh, if you ask her, she thinks she can get it for free from me. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, thank you so much for joining me. Yes, hey, Maestro, great. It was very fun, and uh, uh, your show is great. And thank you. I look forward to talking to you and meeting you in person one of these days. I hope so Maybe too. Thank you so much. Conduct one of my pieces. I know. Yeah, that'd be great. That'd be awesome. Well, thank and you so much. Operas, have you conducted opera? Actually, that's one thing that I've been, you know, uh, really passionate about. I love opera. I just never had the opportunity, just that's arias, theatrical. but I've never, I've never conducted a full-on opera. So uh, one day. Yeah, I hope to get a chance to conduct opera. Maybe yeah. my opera is one of these Yeah, that will be great. That will be great. Well, thank you so much. That was